ladies quartet tonight. All right, young ladies quartet tonight to sing for us. I'll need to... Do you ever get to wondering about the way things are today? So many on board the gospel ship trying to row it a different way. family, me and you, we'd come a lot closer doing what the Lord called us to do. Jesus built this church on love, on love, that's what it's all about. Trying to get everybody saved, not to keep anybody out. The door's wide open and just as big as the Father's heart above. I'm glad he said, whosoever will, Jesus built this church on love. The shepherds found the lost sheep, wandering from the fold. With loving arms around him, he did not play more school. Now we could learn a lesson that would make our our methods and our efforts must be filled with tenderness. Jesus built this church on love, on love, that's what it's all about. Trying to get everybody saved, not to keep anybody out. The door's wide open and just as big as the Father's heart above. I'm glad he said, whosoever will, Jesus built this church on love. I'm glad he said, whosoever will, Jesus built this church on Good job, ladies. Okay, uh, I want to announce the uh, the lottery that we'll be having, and uh, so you can give uh, the lottery tickets are ten bucks. Uh, give it to Jan, and um, you're going to have to pick the day how long it will be before Debbie has the number twenty three Lakers jersey on. All right, I'm going to get out of Jeremiah one of these uh, very, very soon. But if you go back to chapter 40, somewhere around there, we'll get there in a minute. <clears throat> now I'm going to read a familiar verse to you that uh, is not... In Jeremiah, this one is 2 Kings 5.1. Don't bother to turn. You'll know what I'm talking about. And it says, now Naaman, how many of you guys are already thinking of something? Don't, add, don't just kind of raise your hand. To, when I say Naaman, you're already thinking of something? All right. Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man. Great man with his master, honorable because by him the Lord had given great deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor. Then the last four words, but he was a leper. The sermon title this evening is The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Now over the years I've preached this one a few times, but always with a different text. The title is the same. The message is different. And following a little background, we're going to get into the three persons that we'll be addressing tonight. And I started this morning by saying it was going to be a very basic and simple message. <clears throat> Had to do with just believing the Word of God. 
Tonight is uh, simple, but it'll take a few more verses. So first we start with the background. Babylon has now risen to power. They've defeated Egypt. They've subjugated Judah. And then in the 11th year of King Zedekiah, who's the last king of the southern kingdom of Judah, they completely decimated Jerusalem. Now, following this, Nebuchadnezzar left the poor of the land in the land. And he set a man by the name of Gedaliah as governor of those relatively few and poor Israelites. The Bible says he left the poor of the land, uh, well, the poor to, to dress the land and to keep it, basically. But there were some Israelites who had fled either to remote areas of Judah or to surrounding nations. And they had therefore escaped the Babylonian slaughter and captivity. And after Gedaliah had been installed as governor, they returned to Gedaliah to the city of Mizpah, which apparently, definitely, there's more than one Mizpah. You got at least one in Gilead, you got different Mizpahs. This one uh, was located probably six to eight miles northwest of Jerusalem, and it became the kind of the capital seat, if you will, for Gedaliah, for, it'll be for a short period of time. And among those captains returning to Gedaliah were a man by the name of Johanan and another one named Ishmael. You may remember that uh, Moby Dick begins with, call me Ishmael. Don't call me Ishmael. Anyway, those are two out of the three that return, and we'll connect the dots later. So first, we're going to go right to the good, Johanan. <clears throat> In chapter 40, verse 8, he came to Gedaliah. Then they came to Gedaliah to Mizpah, even Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and Johanan, and Jonathan, it goes on. So this guy's a good guy. He came to Gedaliah. And then he warned Gedaliah. He's a faithful man. In verse 13 and 14, moreover, Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of, of the forces that were in the fields came to Gedaliah to Mizpah and said unto him, Dost thou certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, believed them not. So you got this guy's being a good man. I'm submitting him to you as a good man. They came back to Gedaliah. King of Babylon has put him in charge. They come back. And he, he's a good guy. And he warns Gedaliah, this guy's going to try to kill you. He's a faithful, faithful guy. Let's pray. Father, as we look to this portion of Scripture, we pray you'd bless and speak to our hearts that there'll be a message here for us. God, one that we'll understand is from the Word of God, that we'll embrace and apply to our lives. God, that it might be profitable to us, we pray. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It sure is great to be a Christian, isn't it? You know, when we're in America, we can serve God. Thank God for America. I'm thankful for Donald Trump. I always have to qualify that as saying I haven't agreed with all of his, his decisions in life. He's had a few wives and all that goes on. Been a bad guy on occasion, for sure. But as a leader of our country, when he comes up and puts America first, you know, and tax cuts and the judges he's got in there, if he can get another judge in. And, and uh, you know, these are great times for us as Americans to have a man that is an American, that believes in America, that is taking conservative principles. Can you imagine if it, we'd have continued the previous eight years, the direction we were going, in my mind, was un-American. Now, I will say this. Barack Obama apparently was a duly elected uh, president. So I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, that when the people vote somebody in, they vote him in. Right? He gets he got two, two terms and he got it. I didn't like some of the decisions. Now, the whole bunch of people, half, half America, 40% of America, who knows what part of America, don't like some of the things that Donald Trump is doing. But I'll tell you, I'm thrilled. When he puts a conservative guy in the Supreme Court, can you imagine the far-reaching effects of that. And it's indisputable that that kind of person on the bench would not have happened if we had not elected Donald Trump. And now there's another one coming, and he's going to try to put him in, the Democrats are going to fight like crazy. 
But you can rest assured it won't be an ultra liberal. And you can rest assured he's going to go for a good conservative. And he put a list out before we ever get going and said, these are the guys I would appoint. Talk about transparency, which is a refreshing concept. Amen? So I'm thankful to be an American. Anyway, we've seen the good. Next we see the bad, and that's Ishmael. He also came to get a lie in 40, verse 8. Uh, in verse uh, 41, chapter 41, verse 1, they ate bread, bread together. That's, I guess you think it's a nice thing, to sitting down and have a fellowship. However, he assassinated Gedaliah in chapter 41, verse 2. He came in under the flag of peace and viciously and cruelly assassinated Gedaliah, just like Johanan had said he would. Then he slew the Jews and the Chaldeans that were with Gedaliah, Gedaliah that's in 41, verse 3. All those things happened. He came in, ate with him. He killed Gedaliah. He killed the Chaldeans who were still around that apparently Nebuchadnezzar had left. And then he slew 80 faithful Jews. Look at chapter 41, verse 7. See what a punk this guy was. And Ishmael, the son of, he's already killed Gedaliah and some of the Chaldeans. Ishmael, the son of uh, Nethaniah, went forth from Mizpah to meet them. I should have read verse 5. Verse 5. Then there came certain from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, even fourscore men, 80 men came, having their beards shaven and their clothes rent, and having cut themselves with offerings and incense uh, in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. Now they shouldn't have cut themselves. We know that, right? We're all Bible students. You're not supposed to cut yourself to worship God. So things, things creep in that are bad. But these guys are basically decent people that have come to offer to God. And, you know, probably over the years, they've just got some bad traditions that have crept in. So um, here they come. Verse 6, And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went forth from Mizpah to meet them, weeping all along as he went. And it came to pass as he met them, he said unto them, Come to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. What a lying punk. Deceitful from day one. And so it was in verse 7, when they came into the midst of the city, that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, slew them and cast them into the midst of the pit and the men that were with him. So he killed the 80 guys. He's a liar. He's a punk. He's a bad, bad guy. And after that, he kidnapped folks. Verse 10. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah, even the king's daughters and all the people that remained in Mizpah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, and Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. Wonderful. Hey, he comes from Ammon. King sent him over to kill Gedaliah. He kills him, kills the Chaldeans that are with him. He's a lying skunk. He's a bad, evil man. So we got the good and the bad. Now I'm going to go to the good part two. The good part two, Johanan again. He was not only a good and faithful servant, he was a courageous man of action. Chapter 40, verse 15. He's already told him, he's already told Gedaliah that uh, Ishmael is going to try to kill him. Then Johanan, the son of uh, Korea, spake to Gedaliah and Mizpah secretly, saying, Let me go, I pray thee, and I will slay Ishmael, the son of Neth uh, Nethaniah, and no man shall know it. Wherefore should he slay thee, that all the Jews which are gathered unto thee should be scattered, and the remnant in Judah perish? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, said unto Jonathan, the son of Korea, Thou shalt not do this thing, for thou speakest falsely of Ishmael. He said, No, this can't be true. You know? But look at Johanan. What a good guy. Hey, he comes back. He's a good man. He's faithful. He warns him. He said, Not only am I warning you, just give me permission. I'll go take care of him. He won't kill you because I'm going to go kill him. It's nice to have a guy like that around, isn't it? Really, isn't it? He's a courageous man, a man of action. He's a fearless man of war. Go over to 41, verse 11. Now, by now, uh, Ishmael has done all the bad stuff that he was doing, or at least all he could up to that point. He's taking captive people. Now go over to 41, 11. But when Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done, then... They took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and found him by the great waters that are in Gibeon. Now it came to pass, when all the people which were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, 
Then they were glad. You bet they were. They've been kidnapped, right? Of course they're glad. Verse 14. So all the people that Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizpah cast about and returned and went under Johanan, the son of Korea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Ammonites. So it's disappointing that he got away, but he went and conquered the forces. So he's a fearless man of war. Great guy. Not only can talk the walk, he can walk the walk. So there's the good and the bad. Now we're already at the ugly. Here's where it gets ugly. In chapter 41, verse 16, Johanan rounds up the people. So he's defeated Ishmael. He's got the captives back. He's back in Mizpah, probably. Then Johanan, the, uh, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him. Did I tell you I'm in verse 16 now? All the remnant of the people whom he had received from Ishmael, the son of Nehemiah, from Mizpah, after that he had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, even mighty men of war, and the women and the children and the eunuchs, whom he had brought again from Gibeon. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Shimron, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt. Because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had slain Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon made governor in the land. So they said, look, we got a problem. Gedaliah was set up by Babylon. He's already wiped out Jerusalem. He can come back and wipe us all out. We're fortunate that we're still here. And now this knucklehead Ishmael came and did what he did. And we took care of Ishmael, basically, at least his forces. He, he snuck out and got away. But now Babylon's going to be upset. They're going to be upset with us. So they're concerned. They said, I think we better go down in Egypt. Okay? But being a good man, he consults the man of God, Jeremiah. He said, before we go down, we're going to check with Jeremiah. So look at chapter 41, uh, 42, 1 and 2. Then all the captains of the forces and Johanan, the son of Korea, and Jezaniah, the son of Hushabiah, and all the people from the least number to the greatest came near and said unto Jeremiah, the prophet, let we beseech thee, our supplications be accepted before thee and pray for us unto the Lord thy God even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many, as thine eyes do behold. That the Lord, let's go to verse 3, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. So they come to him for counseling, if you will. Now the whole deal is they're going to ask Jeremiah if they should go down into Egypt. And I'm in chapter 42. Let's go over to... Um, Verse 5. <clears throat> then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all the things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We will obey the voice of the Lord, our God, to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. So they said, look, Jeremiah, what should we do? Whatever you tell us, that's what, whether we like it or not. It's not going to be evil if it's from the Lord, right? But uh, if the Lord tells you to go get a job as a, as a ditch digger, as Gertrude would say it, and you're breaking your back and working hard, you say, well, that's evil. It's God's word. It's God's will for my mom, but it's not what I wanted. So in that context, it's like Jeremiah, good or bad, we're going to do what you tell us to do, because we're sending you to the Lord. We know you're a prophet, and uh, we want your direction. So Johanan, being a good man, he checks that out. He promises that they'll obey. But then, if you go to chapter 43, so J Jeremiah says, don't go down into Egypt. He goes back and says, here we go, thus saith the Lord, don't get into Egypt. You stay here, everything's going to be all right. And chapter 43, verse 2 Pride enters in. Then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshahiah, and Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. So all of a sudden, pride enters in. So look, Jeremiah, we know you're a man of God. What are we supposed to do now? Go find out. Whatever you tell us, we'll do. He comes back. He says, don't go to Egypt. 
God said, don't go to Egypt. What's their reaction? No. The Lord hasn't sent you. Look at verse 3. So you get, you got pride entering in, then you got a false reasoning comes along. Man's reasoning is not always good. We spoke this morning on God's word. <laughs> We're still speaking about God's word, and you're going to see it more in a minute. But in verse 3, but Barak, now you know who Barak was. He's the secretary, if you will, the amanuensis. He's the man that wrote down the words of God. He actually preached it to the big guys there in Jerusalem. But Barak, the son of Neriah, setteth thee on against us. He's putting you against us. For to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captive into Babylon. So Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. But Jonathan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from all nations, whether they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah, even men and women and children, the king's daughters and all that, and headed down to Egypt. Verse 7. So they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Thus came they, even to Taphanes. All right. He's a man of action. You know your good qualities can work against you? Listen, when he sees it, that uh, Ishmael's going after him, he goes right to the king and says, look, I've got to tell you right now, he's going to try to kill you. Not only if I bring, they say, Lieutenant, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. He brings a problem and then he brings a solution. Just let me go, I'll take care of him. And he won't kill you. Well, get a liar, should have let him go kill him. In my mind. Is that too harsh? Or am I right? Yeah, he killed 80 guys, he slaughtered them, he's messing up the whole works. He should have been killed. It doesn't happen. Now, <clears throat> here's Johan and a good guy. His boss is dead. <clears throat> he goes and whips Ishmael. And now he says, we're in a tough place. We need to get down to Egypt to save everything. He's a man of action, right? He's a man of courage, a man of action. Hey, we got to go. But being a good guy, I want to check with Jeremiah. Jeremiah comes up back with something he doesn't like. He says, no, Jeremiah, you're wrong. And I think your secretary there is messing you up. He's giving you bad info. We're headed for, for Egypt. And that's what he does. But it's an ugly move. Chapter 44, verse 12. Got a word here I had to look up. And I will take the remnant of Judah that have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there. And they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die from the least even unto the greatest by the sword and by the famine. And they shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. Things are going to get ugly. The word I had to look up was execration. It's to curse, imprecate evil upon, damn, denounce. God says this is not good. We see it's an ugly move. Are you with me? So it starts out, we see the good. Then we see the bad. Now we see the ugly. The good is Johanan. The bad is Ishmael. Now we're into the ugly. And it happens to be Johanan. The same guy that was the good. And they're going to get cursed and the sword's going to get them. It's an ugly execration. It's an ugly stubbornness. Verse 16 and 17. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. They're telling Jeremiah, the prophet... We're not going to listen to you. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. Oh, great. And to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. And for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. As my friend Dennis might say, how did that work out for you? The whole place ended up slaughtered. The holy vessels taken, the, you know, the walls torn down, the palaces burned, everything, everybody killed, guys executed right and left, all of that. But see, it's an ugly execration that, that God curses them. It's an ugly stubbornness. This is just rebellion. 
No, we're going to burn incense to the queen of heaven. And then it's an ugly superstition. Look at verse 18. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour our drink offerings unto her without our men? Listen, when we were worshiping the queen of heaven and bowing down to her and burning incense, things were going good. Superstition. Let's build an idol out here. And every day, you know, go by and kiss the idol, right? Or bow down to it on the way out or rub the nose of the idol or something. And if things go good, we'll say, hey, boy, this thing is working. You might as well have a rabbit's foot. Amen? It's all bunk. All of this has happened. You've got an ugly move to go down in Egypt. You never want to go down to Egypt. Now, I know that God sent people down to Egypt occasionally, but generally speaking, don't go unless God tells you. And they went to ask God, and he said, no, don't go. And they went anyway. It's an ugly execration, an ugly stubbornness, and an ugly superstition. And then there are ugly, very ugly endings. 4427. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. I put down here the sword and the famine resurrected. Why? It just happened in Jerusalem, didn't it? You know, when you camp around a city and, and lay siege to it, there's going to be famine. When you can't get out to get a bite to eat, if they camp out there, sometimes they camp for a couple of years or a year and a half, pretty soon food's going to get very scarce. Wasn't that long ago. God says, okay, you've gone down to Egypt? You think things are going to go well? No. The sword's going to come after you there, and so is the famine. The sword and the famine resurrected. And then, get this, the word of God reiterated. Verse 28, chapter 44, 28. Yet a small number that escape of the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. There'll be a few get out. You know, God's always going to have his remnant. Now, it's not the Jehovah's Witness remnant. Or the Seventh-day Adventist remnant. But there is a remnant. God will have his people. And all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know. Now listen, please. Whose words shall stand, mine or theirs? You're going to find out whose words will stand, God's or yours. And I can tell you the answer right now. So we've got the, the sword and the famine resurrected. You've got the word of God reiterated. It's either God's word or their word, and I can tell you it's going to be God's word. And then in verse 30, thus saith, well, let's read 29. This shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my words shall surely stand against you for evil. You know, this whole thing is pretty simple, isn't it? Just obey God. Obey God. Verse 30. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies, and into the hand of them that seek his life, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy, and that sought his life. He said, you know, you've gone down there because you're afraid of Babylon. The wrath of Nebuchadnezzar will be revisited. Because you're going down to Egypt thinking that's going to take care of something. And God says, no, 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 no. I'll give the king of Egypt. In a battle. You're going to have Nebuchadnezzar's wrath revisited. Same thing that happened to you in Jerusalem is going to happen down there. Why did you go down there? So it wouldn't happen. What's going to happen? Exactly what did happen is going to happen. The very reason you left Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judah, the very reason you fled is going to be the thing that is going to hit you when you're there because you have disobeyed the word of God. Pretty simple. So the true bad will always be the bad. Satan will always be Satan. That's who he is. And some will serve him in an evil way, becoming evil themselves, i.e. Judas. You're going to have the bad. Mark it down. Whosoever will may come, but not everybody will. Amen? You're always going to have Satan. So you're always going to have the true bad. And I believe, and I, I'm sure, 
just by studying the Bible and reading it, God will always have his, with the qualification here, his good. I know there's none good, no, not one. None righteous, no, not one. None good. I understand that. But in that category that we're talking about here, God will always have his people somewhere. There will be some good people around. I didn't say perfect. I didn't say sinless. But there'll be that few that want to walk the narrow way for Jesus Christ. God will always have his people. Good people, courageous people, faithful people, brave people, true people. You believe that? God will always have his people. I don't know how many they're going to be. You know, there are few that find it. Amen. But there'll be some. So you're always going to have the bad. Till we get to heaven. Even the millennium, you're going to have the bad. You're going to have the bad. You're going to have the good. But I'm going to submit to you tonight that the real heartbreak comes when a good man goes ugly. Title, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The real heartbreak is when a good man goes ugly. And it gets real ugly when a good man makes a bad decision. And a lack of faith in God's word is a deal breaker in the downfall. So jo Johanan, he's a good guy. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's literally true in this case. See? And how come? Well, the deal breaker and the downfall is what you do with the word of God. Johanan, obviously we've seen, he's a good guy. He's a courageous guy. He's a faithful guy. He's a loyal guy. But somehow he gets it in his head that we've got to go to Egypt. And when he consults with the man of God and God brings the word down to Jeremiah and they knew he was a prophet. They went to him for that reason. And all of a sudden, uh, human instrumentality and human reasoning, secular reasoning, the flesh gets into this thing and you pull through it. And guess what? Everything turns ugly. It doesn't have to be that way. We have a will. Now, somebody might say, well, what was all that about Naaman? Oh, Naaman was a great captain of the host. He was honorable and victorious for his country. He was a mighty man of valor. But one little thing, he was a leper. Now, leprosy, leprosy is often a sign of sin. And I believe that him washing seven times in the Jordan and everything, I think it's great typology of getting saved. But my point is with him, regardless of whatever sins he did or did not commit. My point is, what one thing usually comes to mind when we think or speak of Naaman? Answer, Naaman the leper. Okay? It's heartbreakingly ugly when we see this hero, Johanan, the good guy, become the very same man who was the ugly. The good became the ugly. It's a heartbreak. In a lot of ways, I wish the story would have ended at Jeremiah 41, 14. When our hero goes and he goes and beats the bad guy, say, man, I love that guy. But it doesn't end there. It keeps going. You can win a great victory today and be a great servant of God. And tomorrow you can fall right into the garbage pit if you're not careful. You can go from being the good to being the ugly. We've seen it happen. I don't want to insult anybody else, but Dr. Smith, we've seen it happen, haven't we? Where that good guy becomes the ugly. He was so good. Reminds me of the old thing, when he's in the pulpit, he's so good, we wish he'd never get out. When he's out of the pulpit, he was so bad, we wish he'd never get in. But in our Christian lives, look, we all have the chance to be courageous, to be valiant, to be strong, to be brave, to be faithful, to be honest, and to be true right to the end. We're supposed to make it to the finish line. Amen? Now, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. That's me and that's you. Some in more spectacular fashion than others. Amen? Some of us, the sins have, uh, have uh, gone before, and some of them are evident right now, and some will come after. But we've all, we're here right now. We're all here, if I can call it the house of God. It's a church. 
We're all here where the purpose is to preach a word, to study the Bible, and to live for Christ. We're all here right now. We are the good. We are the good. We can never be the really bad. We're blood-bought and redeemed. We belong to Christ. We can never really be the bad. But let's make sure we never become the ugly. Father, thank you. God, thank you for this precious word. What we've talked about today, morning and evening, is really the word. Do we believe it? And if we believe it, we'll practice it. And God, I feel bad when I see Johanan, a good mad man, make a, an ugly decision. And the effects of that are terrible. God won't put up with that. Somebody might say, well, preacher, I've made a bad decision. Well, there's an altar here. And I know this. The best option for somebody that's got off track a little bit is to go right to God and beg for forgiveness. And in terms of his mercies, when David's kid was sick, David prayed his heart out. Why? Because he knew God might change the whole works. God didn't. David kept a great attitude. David was a great man. He made a bad mistake. Things went ugly for David. But God, I know this. That God is a God of mercy and compassion. And as we sit here, we either haven't put ourselves in an ugly situation or we have. If we haven't, we need to promise God and ourselves and remind ourselves, God, that we're going to stay true to you. And we're going to follow this word. We're going to exalt it. We're going to stay with it. And God, if we've made some stupid, ugly mistake, best thing to do is pray and say, God, it's me again. I made some ugly decisions. I ask you to forgive me. My heart's desire to serve you with all my heart. God, I just throw myself on your mercy and ask you to bless. If Johanan had started to Egypt and then turned around and come back, I think things would have been different. He did not do that. And things turned ugly. God, thank you. Thank you for being such a great God. Thank you for me personally. Thank you for being so kind and generous and compassionate and forgiving to me. And God, on behalf of my family and my church family, God, thank you. You are the greatest. Blessed we pray as we have a short invitation. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.